Okay, all right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, green jobs making a living while making a difference. Uh, my name is Betta Broad and on behalf of New Yorkers for Clean Power, Citizens for Local Power and Clearwater, we want to welcome you and appreciate you being here and all of our wonderful presenters today. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to our moderator, Karen Mejia, a Newburgh City Council member who's going to be our moderator. Karen? Great. Hey guys, uh, buenas tardes and a warm and heartfelt welcome to our session around green jobs, making a living while making a difference. Uh, the purpose of our gathering is to share, expose, and exchange ideas on how green jobs can achieve training and job success um, in our state here. I want to thank our sponsors, Citizens for Local Power, New Yorkers for Clean Power, and Hudson River School Clearwater for bringing all of us together here, and to our folks who have joined us, participants, for taking a time um, out of your day today on this gorgeous, gorgeous day um, and spending it with us here today. Um, I, will, I wanted to introduce you all to the folks who are going to be sharing their experiences with us this afternoon. Um, we have uh, representatives from Nubian Directions, founded in 1994 and centered around the city of Poughkeepsie. They've been serving the Dutchess County community for over 25 years. Their mission is to provide technology, training, work readiness, and skills and, and adults to enhance workforce skills. Uh, we have Christopher Boston, William Artis, and Robert Wright joining us. They'll be part of the conversation. Um, and guys, feel free to just, you know, do a, a nice little wave when I, when I give a shout out to your name so that folks can put a name uh, and a face together. Also, we have We Act, uh, West Harlem Environmental Action, Inc. So We Act for Environmental Justice. Their mission is to build healthy communities by ensuring that people of color and or low income residents participate meaningfully in the creation of sound and fair environmental health and protection policies and practices. Um, representing uh, WE Act is Cecil Corbin Mark. Hey. Um, we also have Push Buffalo, uh, People United for the Sustainable Housing. Um, they mobilize residents to create strong neighborhoods with quality, affordable housing, expand local hiring opportunities, and advance economic justice in Buffalo. So shout out to our, our friends from Buffalo. We have Brianna DeFonso joining us and Rodney uh, Rainey as well. And um, last but certainly not least, we have energy conservation specialists, William and Melinda McKnight, whose journey started from a very personal experience shortly after they purchased their dream home. Um, and similar to their dream home, their journey has been pretty much like a great love story in my interpretation, um, as they help create comfortable, healthy, safe, and durable places to be for many years to come. And I think it's in that to be for many years to come that I wanna kick off um, the next you know, hour and a half that we have together, because this is certainly for years to come journey that we have. And hopefully uh, the exchange that we're gonna have, you guys will be able to experience and learn from the different um, projects that are taking place around our state. So with that in mind, I want to start off with um, Nubian Directions and giving you guys the floor to share um, your, your journey. You have to unmute. Yeah, Christopher Boston, uh, I'm gonna start for Nubian Directions. Um, I started with Nubian, Nubian Directions uh, on and about 2004, 2005 um, in the youth build program that we ran. Um, at the time we used the HBI packed curriculum, which is the Home Builders Institute pre-apprenticeship certificate training program. Um, at that time we taught five basic modules, uh, building trades safety, uh, construction math, uh, tools and material, employability and carpentry. Uh, on 2009, HBI put out two new modules, which was the green building and the weatherization modules. And that's how we got involved in, you know, starting the, the whole green career um, movement. Um, that, at that time, the units were optional, uh, but we decided to try to plow through and see what we could teach the students as best we can, educate them at least. Um, so we start off with you know, the basic vocabulary, which, which, which students didn't even know some of the, the terminology, like green building and advanced framing, uh, build, build an envelope, carbon footprint. So we start off with that and kind of getting a little bit into that. 
Um, we talked about grey water and storm water uh, in the city of Poughkeepsie. We have a combined sewer, um, and later on we'll talk about our our role with uh, with Manager Green on on an effort to help that out. <clears throat> um, we taught a couple uh, green building concepts for solar, um, passive heating and cooling, which later on played a role in um, some opportunity that we received. Uh, Mr. Wright could probably talk a little more about that. Um, <clears throat> we did the whole house air leakage controller installer, which pretty much teaches you uh, where the house is most susceptible to leak and how you could um, you know, block those um, apertures where, the air, where you lose energy. Um, we, at the time, we, we usually re re renovate uh, an, a home in Poughkeepsie. Um, so some of those techniques that we use yeah, for, for the advanced framing, we actually got an opportunity to use that in the renovation. Um, insulation, we got an opportunity to do, use those insulation techniques in the renovation. Um, so that was, that was great with the hands-on um, hands um, field experience for the students. Um, uh, we started another initiative we took just to kind of get the kids involved. We started an initiative at the office where we started recycling. Um, we did a project where we, um, we kind of analyzed the electrical usage of the building and um, turning off computers at night, turning off lights when you're not in the room and kind of calculated how much energy loss how much energy we saved by doing um, a project like that. So it was very hands-on for the students, which was great. Um, some of our students actually got to do the solar installation course, um, with partnership with Ulster Bosses, um, which was great. Um, and, um, and then Mr. I will talk about some of those all that training kind of led to some opportunity for us to actually go in the community and do some work with uh, Clearwater and um, some of the initiatives. Um, so in general, what I did was prepare the students um, for when an opportunity and a green job came up that they were able to, able to fill that position. Um, it's been a struggle, but um, they had the skills and knowledge to be able to get into a, uh, an employment in a green job. So uh, Mr. Wright will talk about some of those opportunities and then Will will come on to talk about what they're doing now. So I left the program uh, 2013 uh, and I work for Dutchess County, um, but I still, I still keep close contact with Mr. Wright and New Bend Directions and the Youthville program. So, and Will took over um, when I left. So Mr. Wright, uh, you could go ahead and talk sure. about it. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Robert Wright, uh, the Executive Director of New Bend Directions. Uh, here in Poughkeepsie, and let me just say that um, that uh, Mr. Boston, Chris, has done a fantastic job when he was with us, and we hate to see him go. Um, but uh, good people must move on to bigger and better things, and uh, he did. So I just wanted to say that. Also, I wanted to indicate to you that it has been an honor and a privilege to work with um, Mana Joe and Clearwater over the years and her team. Um, there's another organization that we also collaborated with was Green, Greenway Environmental Services and many others, but I wanted to mention those two because they have been uh, wonderful in terms of their uh, commitment to youth and working with our program. So working with Clearwater and Green and Greenway Environment Services, uh, we've done quite a few things. Um, Clearwater taught us about the theory behind water shed awareness, uh, green water uh, storm infrastructure. Um, we've done some community engagement activities, uh, design consultations of neighborhood homes and businesses. Um, our students also were exposed to how to build a biofiltration system for storm water collection and filtering water into our organic garden. Students um, also uh, were involved with uh, learning about elevations and laying out uh, silt traps. Uh, students learned to do basic stormwater runoff calculations and using roof area of our training center for a two inch rainfall calculation. Uh, they conducted water pollution and cleanup workshops using American uh, eels to help connect our Fall Kill uh, Creek watershed 
with the Hudson River and the Atlantic Ocean. So they've done many different things um, in terms of preparing them to, or exposing them to the need to be conscious about the green environment. Um, the challenge, I must say, has been, uh, while we have been very successful uh, exposing our young people to uh, the green economy, uh, finding jobs and opportunities in that area have been more difficult. And I'm hoping that in forums like this and, and working together with other um, entities, we'll be able to make more opportunities available for our young people who may be interested in pursuing uh, a green job. Um, in our program, our students have an opportunity to choose what uh, career path they would, would like to take. And not many have chosen that, um, that career path, the green environment career path. But we are looking to do more in that regard and to expose, continue to expose them and teach them. In addition to um, working with uh, Clearwater, we work with uh, the um, Greenway Environmental Services and our students have been able to install gardens and learn everything about planting and, and, um, and they have been installed our own organic garden at, uh, at uh, Winnikey Avenue property. So it has been a wonderful experience and uh, we would like to get involved and continue to be involved as much as possible. Uh, Mr. Artis has uh, taken over since Mr. Boston left. And um, at this time, you can talk about what our students are learning now and what they're doing. Thank you, Mr. Wright. And um, thank you for inviting us to uh, this wonderful forum. Um, well, since Mr. Boston has left um, the program, it's been a, it's been a struggle because he was such a great asset. But I had some big fit shoes to fill and um, I think I'm doing well. And um, Mr. Mr. Artis, let me just say you're doing an excellent job. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I'm proud to be a part of the team. Um, so we're teaching right now the NICER curriculum. It is um, what has replaced the HBI um, curriculum that we used to teach. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit upgrade version of it and more move more toward uh, the green environment. Um, the NICER stands for National Center for Construction, Education, and Research. And um, the students are required to uh, run a gambit of mods and lessons, eight to be exact. And they have to pass each one. It's a very stringent certification that they acquire. Um, not to mention, um, I'm an OSHA 500 instructor, instructor and we teach uh, OSHA 30 to our students too. So we prepare them for the, the real world. Now, before you get into that blue book, we have another book, Your Role in the Green Environment. And this book here teaches the students their um, conscious, uh, what would I wanna say, um, need to be more aware of their carbon footprint that they leave behind in, in their daily activities and weekly activities. Um, we have a worksheet in there that we um, go through. It's really incredible. I love to preach about this worksheet because you take this worksheet and each one of us fills out our own families, our own families um, usage of everything from food products to um, gas to your garbage that you put out to your wrappers and stuff like that. And you don't think it's much. Oh, I got a couple wrappers. I got a couple gallons of garbage a week. But when you look at it at the worksheet and find out how much energy you waste and how much um, that you can do to save energy, the worksheet breaks it down for you and you're mesmerized by your own uh, attribute to, to the, um, the environment. But when you put a class together and say, now nah, let's add all of our, our worksheets together. And that's just one class and we came up with like 90 some odd tons of 93 tons of waste annually just for the little bit classroom students we had. And then you want to amplify that up to the, the building and see how many people in the building if you add it up or in the town and then so on and so forth. And the students then take, they take note 
a better um, note of you know how to save the environment. Now, more so, we put this um, hands on in our work ethics because um, we had um, the first house we built on Winnicky. We recycled the lumber that we we um, we renovated the apart the houses with and apartments with. We recycled the two by fours from out of the warehouse. So we took the lumber from out of the warehouse, repurposed it, had um, the new apartments framed out of it, and were able to save a ton of money and a ton of the environment. Another thing that we do is um, we utilize recycled uh, material installation that we ins to insulate the houses and apartments with. Um, we definitely practice the community first, the environment first. Um, the students are excited to get out and do this hands-on, but I think they have a healthy fear of, of um, practicing it without us. So if we can all stay together in what we do and um, try to empower the community with um, your role in the green environment and being more conscious of what we do, I think the world will be a better place. And the best place to start is where we are right now. I mean, wherever we are, and we have all of this knowledge as, as a whole, as a collective, if we can generate it out forward from our, our entity, um, I think we'll, be, we'll, we'll do well. I mean, I'm, I've worked with Mana Joe firsthand. She's worked with my kids. She likes everything she does, and we love that about her. Chris Boston's a wonderful man. Mr. Wright has dedicated his life to it. So I feel so at home in the 10 years that I've been with this program that I just want to stay here until I can retire. You know? So, I mean, I'm going to pass it on to Mr. Wright to finish talking about what he had to talk about. And um, it's a pleasure being here, guys. That's all I can say. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Artis. Um, I feel like we are all getting a great uh, sort of overview of the journey that you guys have taken in the organization and how you're connecting to the future generations um, in terms of green jobs. Um, Mr. Raid, you just want to close it off? I'll have about maybe 60 seconds to do that, and then we'll move on to um, our next panelist. But if not, I don't know if it's connection issues. Um, okay, no problem. I just, <laughs> I was speaking without the mic on and I don't know why my video is blocked. It's not a problem. Um, just wanna thank you for this opportunity to share uh, in regards to what we are doing with, with the young people in the community. Uh, we are uh, elated to have, uh, you know, this chance to train the next generation um, and so I think if we all work together, we can get this done and more young people will opt to go into uh, the green environment field. So Great. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and so with that, in terms of continuing with the, uh, all of the different generations of, of, of workers, I wanted to pass it off to Cecil Corbin Mark of, of WE Act. Um, I think actually Cecil is having some technical difficulties joining. So. Okay. Um, if we can actually move to uh, our friends from Push Buffalo, um, Brianna and Rodney now, and then hopefully Cecil will be able to join a little bit later. That would be great. Cool. Thanks, Betta. That's why we have backup. <laughs> All good. To Brianna, there you go. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I was waiting for an introduction. Hi, everyone. Hi from Buffalo. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So I have a couple of slides. Hey. So um, I'm from Push Buffalo, Push People United for Sustainable Housing. And I'm here with my colleague and coworker, Rodney Rainey, um, who's our workforce coordinator. And we just wanted to run down a bit of our um, hiring hall model for you all. Um, so hiring hall started uh, several years ago and it was really 
at the time more of a response to what we saw in our community when we were you know we do a lot of organizing at push and we were out talking to community members and housing and jobs were the two main things that they needed and wanted to work on and make better um and so one of the ways that we did that was to try and purchase and renovate um, housing in our neighborhood and get people skills on our on our training houses and that's a model that we still have today, although a lot of other things have changed or gotten bigger. Um, and we are hoping that you know people can get their initial skills on the training house with push and then go on into you know union jobs and trades and things like that and other construction and people were finding that they were having a really hard time for a lot of reasons but a lot of them being rooted in structural racism that's still very um very prevalent particularly in the construction and trades and unions in our area unfortunately um and so we formed the hiring hall more officially to say all right we know that you know these are good jobs that people want and need and are, are capable of doing so how can we overcome these barriers to get people into these jobs um and so it's changed a lot over the years um it changes based on the needs of the participants, um, the projects that PUSH has going, where our relationships with outside contractors are and things like that. Um, and so, you know, it's not just one thing, but I think that's a strength of it. Um, it always has a core of supporting the people who are in the program with a lot of, you know, things that aren't necessarily training or work, but are the barriers to the training and work like transportation. Um, so making sure that we have real good and deep connections to the people that we're working with and that they're supported and then the rest of the program flows easier out of that. Um, we do trainings and we have right now a range of trainings um, that go from remediation because, you know, particularly in Buffalo, that's part of the green job spectrum as we have some of the oldest housing stock in the country. So knowing how to make the house safe from things like lead and asbestos, and then how to, you know, rehab it into these more green um, trays is definitely very helpful and people kind of plug in at different points in that. Um, and so we have offered different things, but have mostly focused on trainings where it's a shorter term and you can get a, a certification like OSHA um, that's nationally recognized so that people can really take that with them and say, here, this is, you know, a requirement of the job and I have it. Um, and then we also continue to have people work on our projects because PUSH also develops affordable housing. So there's always um, a building or multiple buildings that we're working on that people can be a part of. Um, and then one thing that we do, which has been up and down, but mostly is a very helpful tool, is that we have taken on um, essentially functioning as a high road temp agency where we're the employer of record for people and contractors can work with us to find the right people for the job that they're looking for and then um, you know pay us a fee and then the people are um, on our payroll which we really like because um, a lot of contractors are looking just for temporary labor and so um, we can provide that while doing it in a way that's not as extractive as um, most of the other people in the industry. You know, we ensure they have family sustaining jobs and a lot of um, support. We have things like um, paying for the, all their personal protective equipment and things like that that are often barriers. Um, things like, you know, bus passes and all those sorts of things to make sure that people are able to be successful. Um, and sometimes that's been great and sometimes it hasn't and I think a lot of it depends on where they're placed um, and also for us the goal is is never that that's you know where this ends it's always that this is only a stepping stone into a direct and permanent job um, and we've also had mixed luck there sometimes it works exactly that way and it's you know we're like wow that's that's what we hoped would happen um, but a lot of times it doesn't and again I think it's back to a lot of the the issues um, in the field with structural racism and having a hard time getting into unions and things like that. Um, but we do have a lot of um, 
union partners. I think that's been going pretty well recently. And um, we're really trying to focus a lot on having strong partners with contractors um, and having more of our trainings and things like that focus around what their workforce needs are when it's in this green jobs field. Um, and I'm talking mostly about things that are in construction right now because that's a lot of where hiring hall focuses, but we do also do um, green infrastructure. We do the National Green Infrastructure Certification Program. And there we've had even better luck because that's more um, in need around Buffalo and the city is very behind it. Um, and also we have our own a different social justice enterprise than this one called Push Blue. And so we're actually able to hire the people from the hiring hall um, to be doing these jobs and, and putting in these grid infrastructure. Um, and so I think that's most of what I wanted to say there. Um, just a little note about our future plans and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Rodney. Um, we're hoping to really be able to do more trainings and more advanced green um, techniques with a new training center. Um, and this is not what it's gonna look like. This is just one potential rendering. Um, but the idea is that we have a lot on, you know, in our neighborhood and we're working with the community and with the design team to come up with something that would be a sustainability workforce training center. Um, it would incorporate both a high base space for hands on modules, a classroom space, and then also a greenhouse so that it kind of brings the construction and the green infrastructure a little closer together. Um, and so we're working to get finalize the design team now and going to be building um, and hopefully hopefully open next year if all goes well. Um, so we're really excited about that as part of our future. We envision um, the building really exemplifying a lot of the techniques that we're trying to teach people in. So if we're talking about passive standards or geothermal or solar or things like that, hopefully the building will be able to incorporate all of those and have a lot of um, visibility for them and a lot of um, ways of looking and checking and, and monitoring how the energy usage is so that it can be really a hands-on learning space as well. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rodney. Hello everyone, can y'all hear me? Yep. Um, my name is Rodney Rainey. I'm the Push Buffalo Workforce Coordinator. I am the one that uh, supervises the hiring hall with the contact information and uh, make sure that people apply and they find the right jobs that they need. So I've been with PUSH for about 13 years, uh, started very young, just working my way up, just learning about the company, learning about green jobs, and just being on both sides of the fence when it comes to green jobs is just amazing. Um, actually being a, a, a trainee and then working my way up to be a coordinator, it's, it's just a big difference. So. We basically try to, pe we put people where they belong, wherever they feel like they belong. And that's how I, that's how I work for the Iron Hall. I try to make sure that people are satisfied and that's what we do as a company also. And um, me, and, me and Brianna, we, we've been doing very much within the past months and uh, it's been just amazing. You know, just so much energy that comes with it every day and uh, just, happy to be here to do it. And um, learning the journey to be a worker and then knowing the opportunity to become a coordinator is just, I still can't believe it. You know, it's just something that uh, I look up, I look up to a lot of people for, you know, and um, knowing the young people that I know in my neighborhood, I live in the Western New York area of Buffalo. Um, just knowing the kids and what they've been through also is why I do it. You know, just trying to make sure they have a way out and knowing that there's still hope. And they could also learn about green jobs. You know, I want to make sure that it could be any age. It could be from seven to, you know, 37, you know, so just expanding my mind to those things and just being a good coordinator. You know. I love the work. I don't want to take too much time. I don't know if I'm under time. So, like I said, it's just something to be here. It's an honor. So, definitely. And thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Rodney and Brianna. Uh, Rodney, you mentioned that you started when you were very young. Um, from my eyes, you're still very young. So it's, it's helpful. Um, but I, I definitely heard the, you know, making a living while making a difference in, in, your, in what you bring to, to the work and what Push Buffalo is bringing to the work. So I wanted to thank you guys so much for that. Um, and believe it or not, we're actually on time um, as to where we're supposed to be. So this is really great. Um, I know that uh, Cecil, you were able to join us, so welcome. Um, we did introductions, overall introductions at the beginning. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to you for um, the next portion of our, of our discussion. And just a reminder to folks to continue to use the Q&A portion. Uh, I know you've been typing questions in already. We'll get to them um, as much as we can if they're being typed up and answered now, but also we have a Q&A portion um, after all of our panelists are done. So Cecil. Saw Cecil, but now we may have lost him again. Uh, I think I think he might be having internet difficulties. So we Yeah, oh there he is. I can see you, but I can't hear you yet. Yep, we see you, we can't hear you, Cecil. Guys, and this is how you know you're in a great uh, webinar um, when you have technical issues, so you're welcome. <laughs> Good reframe. Um, so I think maybe we'll skip to if uh, the. Wait, I see he's starting to share his screen. Okay, great. But we still can't. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's let's try the last part of the puzzle, which is to ostensibly get uh, me back on camera, so people can see my full uh, quarantine beard. <laughs> um, just give me one more second. Um, in the meantime, I just want to thank. Uh, Betta and Mana Joe and uh, Jessica and uh, uh, Council Member Karen Mejia uh, for uh, helping to pull this all together. As you all know um, from the prior introductions, my name is Cecil Corbin Mark. I'm the Deputy Director of an organization called We Act for Environmental Justice. And um, we are in our 32nd year of operation, and so this um, this year of all the years has been probably one of the most testing for us technologically, um, but we're, we're managing. Um, I am here to talk a little bit about the Solar Uptown Now initiative, um, and maybe I'll just forget the camera and keep going because maybe that's what's allowing me to both have the bandwidth to run everything. Um, so that's what I'll do. I, I won't worry about that anymore, and then uh, maybe I can just come back later. Um, so uh, Solar Uptown Now is an initiative that we act created in partnership with uh, our more than 400 uh, neighborhood residents that participated in a community planning session uh, back in 2014 in the wake of Superstorm Sandy. Some of those folks were members of WEAC. We are a membership organization, um, and uh, our mission is about building healthy communities, and we do that in partnership with uh, residents in Northern Manhattan, communities of color, uh, to really uh, engage them in campaigns that change both policies and practices around environment and environmental health. And uh, the Soul Uptown Now uh, campaign that I'm about to share with you came out of our Northern Manhattan Climate Action Planning process. 
Um, we brought together, as I said, 400 residents from across the five neighborhoods of northern Manhattan to go deep on talking about and planning for what they, as residents who lived in an impacted community, really thought was necessary to help them uh, and their neighbors survive another Superstorm Sandy. One of the reoccurring themes that came out of that was uh, while northern Manhattan did experience some power outages, we weren't in uh, the very intense situation of having power outage across the entire uh, area of northern Manhattan. It was really more pockets of northern Manhattan that lost power. However, people could look out and see what was happening in the Rockaways or what was happening in Red Hook or what was happening on the Lower East Side. And as a result of that, talked about really being able to have more control over their own energy. Um, and so the Solar Uptown Now uh, campaign is really, uh, initiative, sorry, is part of our broader Northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan. Um, and that, as I said, grew out of our efforts to create greater resiliency. You can go to the website, uh, WEACT's website, and just literally click on weact.org forward slash climate, and you'll be able to see more about that plan. Uh, in that plan, people talk about emergency preparedness and energy democracy. And out of that energy democracy bucket, uh, we began to really build out what people were talking about, having greater control over the sources of energy in their communities so that they would not uh, be subjected to it. Um, but their demands weren't only for greater control, they were also for it to be an opportunity to create jobs for people in our local community, a pathway into the green new economy, and to also make sure that whatever we put up in terms of energy structures in our community did not contribute to the already existing burdens of uh, respiratory health uh, and other environmental health disparities that we're experiencing uh, in our northern Manhattan community. Um, and then finally, people talk about really the challenge of affordable housing in northern Manhattan. And so within our mission, uh, we have tried to figure out, well, how do we help our members with the issue of affordable housing? And we landed on uh, this made sense for us, given our mission as an organization, primarily because after you pay your rent or your mortgage, your second biggest nugget of cost is the energy uh, in your home. And so we wanted to use this as a pathway to make sure that we could help sustain affordability in housing for residents in northern Manhattan as well. Um, the workforce pieces of this that I want to focus on is that uh, we have made a commitment coming out of our uh, northern Manhattan Climate Action Plan and the evolution of our Solar Uptown Now initiative was uh, to make sure that we provided a pipeline of diverse uh, residents from northern Manhattan to enter into the solar industry. Uh, our workforce comprises primarily of young men, but we are also very uh, keen on recruiting uh, women uh, and people of all ages to come into this program, and we have successfully graduated some women through the process as well. What do folks get as they go through the process? Uh, OSHA 30 construction certification, uh, they get scaffolding certification, they get flagging certification, they get, uh, in some instances, BPI, Building Performance Initiative, uh, uh, in Building Performance Institute training, which helps them understand better some of the systems in buildings that use energy, and then solar installation and deployment. Um, we also uh, provide for the folks going through our training a series of soft skills for life. So we teach them about financial matters. How do you open up a bank account and how do you save money? We talk to them about interview preparations and making them ready for uh, the actual work world that they're going out into and to how to navigate particular challenges, for example, like although ban the box is supposed to be in effect, we also know that many of the people in our community who may be returning citizens uh, returning from incarceration, uh, that they may be challenged by the realities of how different uh, workplaces enforce or don't enforce the ban the box. And for those of you not familiar with ban the box, it basically bans employers from asking questions 
uh, of whether or not someone was incarcerated in the first go rounds of their interviewing process. So we teach them how to navigate and deal with that part of uh, the interviewing process. And we also teach them other types of life skills, being punctual, uh, making sure that they are ready for, you know, childcare issues if that's part of their life as well. Um, and some time management and planning skills. So those are the things that the uh, participants in the training program will come out with. We also train in both English and in Spanish. Uh, we recognize that uh, a large cross-section of the northern Manhattan uh, uh, population is Spanish-speaking. And even if they aren't Spanish-dominant, one of the things that they uh, uh, are uh, maybe is more comfortable actually learning something in Spanish. And so we tailor and accommodate our trainings in that way as well. And you're seeing a picture of one of our Spanish-led uh, uh, classes as well. Uh, the opportunity, we try to share with them the opportunity for how the solar field is growing. Um, next, behind California and Massachusetts, uh, New York State, I believe, is the third state according to the uh, 2018 uh, solar job census in terms of uh, production of solar jobs and uh, that is only going to continue to grow. Despite what's gone on with the pandemic, we foresee continued growth in this field for some time yet to come. And that's not just us, that's based on the Solar Foundation's reporting and the experts, uh, both economists and, and solar professionals that they rely on to put together this report. And so we see this as a growth area, and it's one of the reasons that we continue to uh, try to do that. I want to share with you some of the metrics of what we're doing. Again, true to the program, we're not just creating a jobs program, but we're creating a program that ultimately addresses a number of challenges that are dealing, that are impacting our community. So our work, uh, and these, these, this uh, sheet needs to be updated, but I'll share it with you anyway. Um, at the end of 20, uh, at, at midpoint of 2019, sorry, we had surpassed 408 kilowatts of uh, solar installation uh, power generating uh, an offset for common area builds. And for common area builds, uh, just so that people understand what that is, those are the charges that people are in a uh, HDFC or a co-op uh, uh, or in a building, uh, rental unit building, seeing for the lights in the hallways, uh, the lights in the elevator, the elevator operation itself, things like laundry rooms, community rooms, common shared areas, etc. cetera. Um, the program uh, was able to install and offset uh, 408 kilowatts of, of uh, expected charges uh, of solar. Uh, by installing solar, and we were able to uh, create a benefit for uh, more than 900 residents uh, in doing so. Uh, the expected electricity savings are about 1.5 million over 25 years. Um, we're going to, uh, we, by that time, we were projecting to displace uh, more than 1,200 pounds of uh, 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 NOx pollution and uh, 29, over 2,900 tons of greenhouse gases would be offset annually. Um, at that point in time, we had trained 75 uh, workers. We're now up to more than 200 uh, in photovoltaic installations. We, at that time, had five uh, local green jobs in which people were installing solar on the rooftops in their neighborhoods. Um, and we've now placed over 20 people in the solar industry itself out of the 200 that we've trained. Um, those metrics are important because this is a partnership effort. Um, we want to be able to show to folks that we can put people to work. So some of our partners you'll see uh, later in our supporters include the Department of Labor, uh, New York State Department of Labor. We worked with the mayor's office. These entities provided funding, the Kresge Foundation, the Energy Foundation. And we want to be able to show uh, progress on a variety of different fronts in terms of training people, putting people to work, getting people into uh, uh, solar industry jobs, as well as these other types of benefits in terms of pollution reduced, uh, climate resiliency improved, uh, public health issues impacted or, 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 or pollution decreased. All of those types of things are important for us because the constituency of funders and supporters for this initiative, uh, we want to be able to continue, and so we want to be able to show progress on a variety of different fronts. 
Um, here's just a slide to give you a sense of the uh, number of people that we've trained. Uh, again, 18 to 24 year old youth means 18 to 24 year old, and then uh, uh, we've gotten adults as well as youth, and so uh, we were able to train more than 200 people uh, in solar. And then in terms of getting them deployed in jobs, this is one of the bigger challenges that we face in the solar industry. We've only at this point been able to put 25 people to work. Uh, we keep working on that in terms of developing more partnerships with uh, solar installers and really uh, building relationships with them and demonstrating to them through the quality of the candidates that we put out um, what we're able to produce in partnership with our, our good friend Solar One, who partners with us on the training. Um, the quality of people, given the life skills that we're training them with, given the other types of assets that we're trying to help them acquire and putting them out into the workforce. And a lot of this is built on trust. Uh, in some instances, we're also exploring the possibilities of using public dollars to create uh, onboarding kinds of uh, funding for some of the workforce, and I'll talk about that in a second as I move on, but this is another pathway that we're thinking about. When we receive funding, we are now trying to also ask for funding that will allow us to uh, allow the workers to be placed at a work site. We'll pay for the beginning part of that and then let them demonstrate their capacities and abilities that we're confident in, but the workplace may not be. And then say then you, once you take them on, let's see you keep them on uh, during the course of the job itself. And so incentivizing uh, that work opportunity is another way to think about how we might use our meager resources, I know, but um, it's a tough space to be able to sort of break through some of these barriers. Um, we always want to celebrate the success of the people that we are working with. This is a community organizing effort. Uh, we've organized a number of low and moderate income cooperatives um, and a number of affordable housing operations that are operated by nonprofit organizations. Uh, and we've had success. And so where we do, we want to lift that up. We want to get uh, news coverage for it. We want to highlight the fact that our trainees have been successful in doing this and share that with other solar operators so that we can then ply them for uh, more openings for jobs when they have them. Um, and so that's another key to our program that we think is critical and important. We don't just get media coverage for ourselves. We try to amplify our you know, partnerships, whether it's with a solar installer or whether it's with uh, affordable housing co-op or um, a 501c3 organization. We want to share the love so that people see and feel like they're part of this program and that they have a stake in making sure that it's successful. Um, another one is, uh, this is a specific, this was one of our very first HDFCs. HDFCs, I, I want to just be clear, is a term that might be specific to New York. It's a housing development finance corporation, and it is our, one of our target, uh, uh, targets for the deployment of our program. Um, these are former tenant-occupied buildings where the landlords abandoned them, and the city put them through a, rent to, through a training program to make them cooperators. And they are under significant stress in our community, and so this is the part where we're really focusing on how our mission intersects with the affordability and housing. We're really targeting these HDFCs to say, we've got a pathway to helping you reduce costs uh, and provide jobs to people in the neighborhood and do all these other benefits. And so um, this was one of the very first ones uh, that we did and it was one of the first in the nation. This was a model that we pioneered um, and I'm proud to say it is a, a we act brainchild and baby. Um, our organizing helps us leverage the trust that was needed to help people who are technology averse or sometimes resistant to change um, to really get involved and that's one of the hallmarks to uh, our success as well. Um, the I'm other so thing I wanted to... Sorry, just giving you a one minute warning. One minute coming. Uh, the other thing I wanted to share with people is that um, we had success finally. We wanted to focus on three types of affordable housing. So you heard me talk about the other two HDFCs and 501c3 affordable housing operators. But we also want to get people in NYCHA, New York City Housing Authority, enrolled in our training programs, putting solar power up on their roofs. 
There's a little complication that they, inside of NYCHA, very few NYCHA buildings will actually be able to use the power that we put up on their roof. But this is a longer conversation about transforming the role of NYCHA housing in our community. We want to use this effort to also make sure that people don't only think about public housing as blighted housing, right? You have all types of public housing. The White House is public housing. And, uh, and public housing like NYCHA exist in this country as well. And the idea that all public housing is blighted and broken and bad has to change. Um, these are critical assets and we wanna be able to put solar power on, on top of the roofs of some of our houses uh, uh, and to be able to provide affordable power by allowing low income, moderate, affordable housing uh, in the community to buy into this by having actual solar, uh, community shared solar arrays. So we're gonna install, uh, we have all the green lights, we just are now dealing with the COVID-19 crisis, um, but we have all the green lights to install 120 uh, kilowatts of power at a cost of 360,000 on Carver houses in East Harlem, and then train 25 residents to do that installation. So we're really excited about that. Um, and again, another partnership with Solar One and others across the city. Um, for us, the frontier, the future frontiers include uh, continuing to figure out how we can leverage more of the commitments under the city's 1NYC plan uh, to put renewable uh, power on all city-owned buildings. So we're targeting schools, fire stations, police stations. We think that this is a growth field for us uh, based on that particular uh, legal commitment by the city to uh, put renewables on, on city-owned buildings. We're expanding a partnership with, building on a partnership we have with the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 3 to create a pathway to offshore wind development career opportunities, which is happening off the coast of, uh, of New York State. And then these are our partners always, as I said, in terms of lifting this up. Uh, the Energy Foundation logo uh, uh, is there, the Kresge Foundation, uh, the New York State Department of Labor, the governor's office and his team, Solar One, our critical, critical partner, the CUNY partnership, uh, Sustainable CUNY, and then New York City's Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Um, it takes a village to make a village come to renewable life and create jobs underneath us. So I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much. Um, and you're so correct about the taking a village, um, especially not only just in this area, but in, 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 in overall. Um, so I just want to remind folks again, uh, please uh, include your questions in the Q&A portion. Um, yay, Cecil you, Cecil, you got the camera to work. Perfect. Um, so I think at this point of our um, agenda that we had, I wanted to pass it over to Bill and Melinda McKnight, um, co-founders of Energy Consortium Conservation Specialists. Um, can't wait to hear about the love story you guys have. So <laughs> go for it. Thanks. Um, we've been in business for 2010, uh, serving uh, seven counties in the Mid-Hudson Valley from um, basically as far south as Orange County um, and Putnam on the other side, and then as far north as uh, Greene County and Columbia County uh, and as far west as uh, Delaware and Sullivan. Um, we've, we're essentially a building science based energy efficiency retrofit consulting and diagnostics company. Um, we have um, really focused, uh, transitioned more toward moving people off of oil and gas and to uh, electric electrification. We really see energy efficiency and solar along with heat pumps as a three-legged stool and that energy efficiency is really um, fundamentally important to achieving the transition um, away from fossil fuels. So to that end, um, our home is fossil fuel free as well as our, our new uh, soon-to-be company headquarters that'll be opening uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, we're a relatively small company. There's a total of 10 of us. Um, we have, we standard issue prote personal protective equipment, um, including Tyvek suits, NIOSH res respirators to all of our staff. Um, everyone is paid a living wage. Um, and we have been a NYSERDA partner since, um, 2011. 
we really focus on using the most green and most aggressive insulation and air sealing materials available on the market. Um, we focus um, a great deal on health and safety. Uh, you mentioned our love story. We, we started out before we were in this field with a, a situation in our own home with um, air quality and mold. And uh, it was a real journey to figure that out. Um, and I'm asthmatic, so that's something that, that was a very big concern to us. And we're very sensitive to that um, with our, our customers. Um, we, we really serve all uh, income demographics. We, we really um, approach what we do from a perspective of, you know, everyone deserves a, a healthy, safe, durable um, home and comfortable home to live in. And, um, and so we view the programs that we participate in and the other financing tools that we have arranged um, to really be able to meet people where they are. So, you know, we, we're happy to do a full, um, very large project, but we're also happy to figure out a phased approach that's doable for people. Um, so we do our best to be really sensitive to, to all of that. Um, we're a building performance institute accredited and certified company. Um, we're EPA lead safe certified. Um, OSHA. Um, so I'm going to pass the youth aspect of our conversation over to Bill. Thanks, everybody. And thank you for uh, inviting us to participate in this forum. It's, uh, I think it's extremely important. And uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, it, it, some of the, you know, some of the issues with um, getting young people interested in energy efficiency um, kind of is, uh, you know, it's been a stumbling block for some of the businesses in our region. And for us, what we, with the way we approached it is um, in 2014, we hired a 19 year old young man and uh, trained him in air sealing and insulation techniques. And we, and we trained him based on Building Performance Institute uh, uh, criteria and standards. And he excelled and then left our company and then when he came back um, about a year later um, in, in 2018, uh, we did some additional training with him and he is now in charge of our field operations um, and also doing training of new technicians. So it's kind of like you get the ball rolling and if somebody's really interested in it and they kind of get the bug, they will come back and, and get involved in the, in the, the trades themselves and, and really take it and, and run with it. Uh, we also hired a young man in 2015 who's a 16 year old uh, high school student and we trained him as an audit assistant initially he was homeschooled and um, we trained him to do computer modeling uh, for some of the, the building model software that uh, we use through nice sort of programs and he left our company to go to college now he's working for an IT company doing doing uh, he writes software uh, and but he's also still interested in, in, in energy efficiency and it kind of really got him jazzed about um, doing this type of work. Um, and twice a year, I do trainings at uh, the uh, BOCES in Port Ewan um, in Ulster County, New York. Um, I also, we do a lot of uh, tabling events uh, to introduce people at job fairs and so forth to um, introduce young people to energy efficiency. Um, talk to them about LED lighting, talk to them about solar, about air source heat pumps and some of the new technologies and let them know that there's opportunities for these young people to really get into a career that they can take anywhere in the world. I mean, countries like Germany are way ahead of us. We're so far behind. Uh, but, um, you know, you're, in Europe, you really want, they, they've really taken this to heart and, they, and we need to do that here in the United States as well. Um, uh, we um, also, I've done PowerPoint presentations at SUNY New Paltz um, and Rutgers University to, uh, for young, young college students who uh, want or are interested in energy efficiency. Um, and one of the issues that we've discovered is that most of the contractors in the building trades average around 56 years old. 
Um, so we need to train an army of installers and energy efficiency measures in order to meet the state's climate goals, which are fairly aggressive. And um, our youth program is focused on introducing young people to the fields of energy efficiency and building sciences. Um, we're completely self-funded. We've gotten, um, we have worked with the Department of Labor um, in Kingston to get uh, OJT funds for employees um, and several adult hires, but not for training um, or employment of, of uh, young students that are just coming out of, of high school yet. Uh, that's something that we're looking at in the future. Um, another thing I want to add is that it's um, it's not essential for folks to come to us with a, with a college degree or a full knowledge even of um, air sealing and insulating. Um, we do all of the hands-on training um, in our company and it's really more important that folks who enter this line of work are really comfortable in um, some pretty uncomfortable situations. Um, we work in tight spaces. Um, it's definitely not the, the most clean or um, glamorous, or glamorous <laughs> work, um, but it's, it's absolutely essential. And um, you know, we need to retrofit approximately uh, 700 homes a day for the next 30 years in order to um, do all of the housing stock uh, in New York State. So um, we, we do need an army of installers and we're looking to partner with organizations that train young people. Um, again, we're not a big company, but um, one of the reasons why we haven't been able to maybe grow the way that we want to is because of a shortage of, of folks interested in doing this work. So um, anyway. I think that's all yeah. we have. Thank we'll be, you. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has. Yeah, no, thank you guys so much. Um, and thanks to all the panelists as well. And um, there's some questions that have popped up. Um, they've gotten addressed, but I'm going to just sort of like put them in into um, a different bucket because um, I think all of you guys uh, have a lens that we can have a conversation about this and um, the McKnight's I'm going to start off with you guys as a sort of an overarching right the the data point you just shared with us 700 homes per day like that is I you know I can't it's hard right to I'm having a hard time putting you know wrapping my head around that and then I wanted to open it up to all the panelists to talk a little bit about what is it going to take right to build up that cadre of individuals um, so if folks can talk a little bit about what's been like your most um, uh, successful outreach um, and what do you look for uh, on individuals right and one of the questions that came from the Q&A um, I'm, I'm gonna layer it not only just for youth but also for folks who fall out of the youth category right one of the things that came up in the Q&A was what about those folks um, that you know are 50 and plus or 40 and plus um, that are some those hard to hire categories right that would be willing to take all of these you know those these risks right because they've had certain experience so I want to focus a little bit on, on the, the Q&A portion around that on outreach strategies successes and what do you look for when you recruit for us <laughs> um, outreach strategies um, for us have been mainly through the New York State Department of Labor uh, it's you know, that's definitely one area that is a, a little bit of a struggle. Um, but we've hired, we've hired adults as well as, as young people through the various outreaches that we've done. And um, I'm, I'm confident that with the work that I'm doing with the HVAC te um, teacher at BOCES, that some of his students have, who've expressed an interest in working with companies like ours um, are, are going to reach out to us um, in the future to, to look for work. Um, but there, we've hired, you know, we've hired, we hire veterans. We look to hire uh, people who were previously incarcerated. We, we don't um, look down on them. We, we give them an opportunity and we've had several of them that turned out to be some of the greatest workers that we've ever had. I would say that they're really, 
um, isn't necessarily an age limit for what we do. I would say that um, it really is about um, your physical ability to be in the spaces um, that, you know, that can certainly be a little limiting depending on, you know, your comfort level in, in, a, in a crawl space, uh, you know, or tight attic. or a tight attic. Um, they can be pretty uncomfortable for, for folks. Great. Thank you, guys. And how about um, some of the other panelists? Um, artist? If I might, if I might, um, unfortunately, our um, youth build program is designed to help students um, of a lesser uh, prominent um, affluential um, group, but um, our age group is limited to 16 to 24 years of age, but um, as Mr. Wright's heart is big as it is, doesn't matter how old someone is, he's always open to help whoever comes to our door. And I mean, we, we do whatever we can for the community. We, um, we put that out there for the, for the students. And there are people that are older looking for places like, Ms. I mean, for the McKnight's, like the McKnight's have, that come to our door, but we're not able to help them because of our age restriction. Right, and so hopefully by when we have these types of gatherings, right, like Mr. Artis, if you get somebody, you can now funnel them to the Magnites, right, if, if it's there within the region and stuff. So I think that that's also helpful. Um, Cecil? So I was just going to um, uh, add that in terms of our success for outreach, I would say first and foremost, you really do have to concentrate on creating a good program. Um, word of mouth is one of your most uh, successful, at least for us, has been one of our most successful outreach tools. So we really work hard to make sure that the experience that uh, the people who coming through our who come through our training program have is one where they feel supported as much as possible, and that the that they're getting something of value for their time and effort. I do think that you have another important thing that has to be addressed up front, and I don't know if this is true for uh, the Hudson Valley region, but it is certainly true in New York City. Um, a lot of the people that we reach out to have been trained to death. And what I mean by that is that they've had exposure to any number of training programs, and you can find uh, people trained with a variety of skills in our communities. But the challenge for them is that after those training programs, there's not always a job there for them. And that's the critical thing that they need. And so we constantly are working hard to, even if we can't get them into the industry, one of the things that you saw on the slide that I showed you was that we've placed 25 people into the solar industry, or I think it's a little bit more than that now, but we placed 25 people into the solar industry. But even if they didn't get that job in the solar industry and we continue to try to figure out how to crack that nut, we work with them to find a job here because one of the things that we don't want to have happen is that the experience is repeated, oh, I went through all of this training and I still can't get a job. So we're very clear about what the challenges are up front with people. We work really hard to try to build those relationships to make sure that there are some opportunities for us to get them in front of people to get access to being interviewed. Um, but we also, if they don't get into the solar industry, we make a commitment to definitely trying to help them find work uh, sometimes it's in a related construction industry or something like that, and we keep in touch with them to say, look, you know, we'll, we'll continue to find an opportunity for you as they come along for us. Um, but I think those, uh, in terms of outreach, are three things that I would want to share with you all. Uh, make it a good experience for them so that word of mouth is positive about your program. Really work with them uh, to uh, get into the solar job. And if you can't get them into a solo job, continue to work with them to make sure that they have uh, an opportunity to get a job somewhere because that's really what took them down this path in the first place was the real need to be able to get something uh, to provide them with income. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Brianna and Rodney, I want to make sure that um, I check in with you guys as well. Well, a lot of them um, say that. Uh, me as a workforce coordinator, I've, I've been through a lot as a person. Um, happy to happy to just be here, um, learning from 
from Push Buffalo, learning from other construction companies um, that that led me to the green job world, basically. So I started my first net zero house on the west side of Buffalo, New York. And um, it was pretty amazing because I live all around the west side of Buffalo. So I, I'm just like, I'm still growing, still young and just I'm plunging at it to the and there's no ending to it you know when you like something that you like have a passion for and like community and like even green job as a as a word as a definition and um it, it carries yourself it carries it just carries you as a, a person you know and, uh making my work easier because i can understand where workers come from i i i um used to be a worker you know so it kind of amps, it amplifies everything I'm saying. And um, just working with Brianna is just, just definitely amazing too. So uh, learning from her and my other coworkers and just everybody, you know, I like what I do and just appreciate what I do. Thanks. I think um, I responded a little bit to some of the questions in the comments that you summarized, Karen. So I'll, I'll leave those there, but definitely, um, for us, a lot of it comes back to our organizing perspective and our just analysis on the economy. And that's not something that I got into and, and I, I won't get into, but, um, you know, seeing that there's a lot of these really structural things um, and how, how are we going to help individual people without helping those structural things change. Um, so a lot of the work that we try to do is focused on that. Um, or is a combination of both, you know, you have to know the individual and be able to support them well. And you also have to try and be going to the root of things to see, you know, how can, how can we get things to change? Cause we can spend our whole lives just trying to connect people to bus passes. But when, you know, you, they're dealing with racism from police and they're dealing with cut lines for the buses and they're dealing with, you know, all of these other things that go into transportation, um, we have to be working on on those things as well, at least, you know, from our perspective as a, as a nonprofit and a community organizing agency, that's where we see a lot of our role. Um, and hopefully we, you know, partner and complement with the other people who are in the field who are also um, doing this work and have really, really important roles to play that, you know, that we can't do. Uh, I know you guys have been answering, you know, some of the questions in the, in the Q&A as well. Um, and you guys move fast because before I can like finish off, it's like it's done. So thank you for making uh, my responsibility a, a, a village, right? So this is really good. Um, quickly, do you guys want to talk a little bit about maybe some of the different salary range because we have so many different regions represented, right? We have you know New York City, we have the Hudson Valley, and then you know we we, we have um, uh, Buffalo, the Buffalo area as well. So can you guys talk a little bit about the um, the range of salaries that you know can be forecasted and uh, if you go through these types of jobs uh i can say our start room for us we started we started at 15 dollars an hour um and um it depends on what company uh sends email to us and they say oh we need we need two guys from landscape work and they might they might have a twelve dollar an hour position, or they might have another company that uh, has a ten dollar per hour position. It varies throughout uh, who contacts me as a coordinator. Um, it's, it's various companies or uh, various training programs that uh, they seek workers. So it may depend on who who calls us and uh, but the, the start is fifteen. Yeah, and I'd say when they're direct placements, I've seen anywhere between 12 and 20, depending on the job and the skills and the training that's needed to, to enter it. Um, push starts at 15 if, if they're employed with us, but other places, it's definitely a range which can be challenging. <laughs> yeah, and that, this, is, this is Cecil. I will say that, um, you know, when you look into the state's record, the state basically says that the solar and solar jobs at the state level are roughly at about $19 an hour. Um, in New York City, 
I know that you, depending on what the project is and, and where it is, um, you can get sometimes a little bit more than that. Um, and I know that, like I've also heard, one of the things that we do is we try to get people uh, through, we support them through the NAPSAT exam so that they can also move around and be able to sort of, you know, if they wanted to move nationally to um, take the uh, take solar installation jobs elsewhere. So it is a, a varied uh, experience for them in terms of what they can earn. Well, I was going to say, um, those numbers are good for um, entry level jobs. But we've had um, some connections with construction companies in the city and, and with the SCA, the, the school construction authorities that we put some of our students in prevailing wage jobs from the door. Um, after they've been certified with us, we've gotten them jobs where they will be getting paid $72 an hour, um, $120 an hour on Saturdays. But unfortunately, with the, with the students that we had there, after they got their first paycheck, they didn't show up for work or, you know, and they, they kind of like messed that up for themselves. But um, we're still trying to get that type of a job or a career set for our students because we don't want them going out um, getting these um, McDonald's Burger King. Not saying that they're not bad, I mean that they're bad, or Dunkin' Donut jobs. Somebody has to do it, but I think what we're training all of these people for and to, to be green people is to save our planet. And this is what we, this is what we're doing. We're trying to get these kind of jobs. So I like, to try to shoot for the stars. And um, sometimes I hit the moon, but that's what we do. We go for the, we go for the goal always. No. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I just want to say that that is amazing to get to find somebody a hundred dollar hour uh, job. That is amazing. Um, and that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, for us, we're a, a pretty small company and we focus on single family homes primarily. Um, we tend to start uh, someone with no skills while they're training um, at slightly below 15 with a goal to absolutely get them up to 15 um, after as quickly as possible after that training initial training period. Um, we have done municipal projects that pay prevailing wage. And for us, um, that's thirty-two dollars. In insulation hour. is thirty-two dollars an hour, so. Um, so it's a range. Right. And right. It's yeah. Depends on what someone brings to the table. Right. And it depends your location too. You exactly. Know? The location down in the city, Staten Island, Brooklyn, those jobs we would. It is a hump, but that's what the people were paying, and I mean, it, it is incredible. I was always astounded by the fact that. These kids, and this is what I would tell them, isn't it incredible that you're making more an hour than your parents ever did, you know? And they're stuck with it. They're shocked. The parents are excited, but then they drop the ball because of their immaturity. You know, it's unfortunate, but we're going to keep plugging. Great. Hey, Karen. Yes. Uh, can I just add one thing to this conversation? A lot of what we're doing right now is focusing on the hourly job piece. And I wanted to lift up uh, something that Brianna was saying, because we have a similar take on it, which is that we also need to be thinking about sort of what are the structural causes of the, of the economic disparities and the economic stress that our communities are facing. And so for us, one of the things you heard me say at the very beginning, or it may have passed over you very quickly, the part of the way we approach this is really through the concept of energy democracies. And I was very explicit, I tried to be very explicit about really talking about the notion that people wanted to be able to control their electricity, to be able to turn their lights on and off after the next Superstorm Sandy event. And so to that end, one of the things that we have done is that we took some of the best and brightest of our trainees and we, in partnership with uh, the Green Worker Cooperative, put them through a cooperative training program um, to be able to start and launch their own solar installation worker cooperative. The initiative that we act is called Sun Solar Uptown Now. 
Um, <clears throat> and the cooperative just launched and is now officially a, a cooperative, and it's called Solar Uptown Now Services Sons. Um, sorry, don't mean, don't pardon us for being cheesy. Um, but that is really creating a leg into the foundation of the uh, green economy where people from our community who treat previously did not have any kind of ownership over uh, the economy uh, now have their own sort of business that they are running. And, you know, they're going to have to, you know, grow that business and they're starting out. They just, Literally, I, I, when they told me about this, they went out and did a bid for a job. I was like, you bid for a job in the pandemic? But that's how eager they are to get started. Um, and, you know, they're going to have to be subcontractors for a while. But over the years, that entity will grow into its own installation business. And then uh, the repayment for us sort of incubating them is that they will have to create opportunities for work for the people that we continue to train as well. So that's a model of sort of, you know, creating uh, opportunity for ownership of part of the green new economy moving forward. And I think we should be also recognizing and lifting that up and talking about that as well. Thank yeah, you, no, Sasa. Thank you. Yeah, that no, was thank amazing. You. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to do that as well. More community control of the economy, definitely. Anything less than ownership is unacceptable and we need to build our community wealth as well. That's Sorry, I'll, but thank you, that was good. No, 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 it's perfect. Look, I had it even written down when you said it before. I don't know if you can see it, cause I'm, you know, but I had it like this whole concept of the energy democracy, right? So I think it's it's in that voice that we have about five minutes left. Um, and I wanted to, you know, sort of give out uh, to the panelists one minute to sort of close us out in that spirit of, you know, energy democracy and democracy in general, right? Given everything that we're going through right now um, as a, as a humanity so um melinda and and bill i know you guys were trying to get in so we'll kick it off with you guys you know a minute each um i know it's super short but i hope that this is the beginning right of this cadre of you know green conversation so pass yeah I, I just wanted to share that um bill mentioned that the average age of a contractor doing this work is 56 years old uh, we are within that range ourselves. And so part of our exit strategy is to turn our company into a co-op. So that's our exit strategy. Yeah. And we've done, you know, we've done, we've moved a lot of the, our, our workers that have been with us for longer periods of time. Obviously we've made, let them know that they're, they're earning a share of our company and that gives them a stake in, in it and they have to have they have to have some skin in the game in order for this to really work yeah i mean we we definitely focus on increasing um role of responsibility we do have some folks who work in the field who are salaried um you know we do provide um sick time vacation time personal time and our employees all get their birthday off with pay yes that's true um we're not in a place yet to be able to offer um health insurance and things like that but we're moving in that direction that's something that we want to be able to do for for all of us um so well thank you mcknights that's a wonderful love story continue to share the love um nubian directions i know there were three of you guys um but i can't see everybody so Mr. Bring us home. Had to, he had to take care of something any parting words around just the democracy aspect that I think we want to end on? All right, um, Push Buffalo. I know you guys have stated it already and uh, Cecil Tambien, come on. And then I'll, I'll look for um, Breda uh, and, Beta and um, Mana Joe. And Jess, you guys have been phenomenal putting this together. I just want to thank everybody. This is amazing, inspiring, and the world we want to materialize uh, in the future. So I'm extremely grateful to all of the speakers today and to you, Karen. Thank you for letting me participate. Go ahead, Cecil. 
Oh, I was going to say, go ahead, Brianna. But, uh, you know, the, I think that uh, this is possible. I think it's the first thing that I want to end on. The, the idea that we can create sort of pathways to ownership of, our, of the economy. We won't be able to get there with everyone. That, you know, is a numbers game. But I think the more we're able to sort of seed opportunity for people in communities of color and low income to really see that they are and can be a critical part of the economy, not just as hourly labor, uh, but people who are, you know, uh, mistresses and masters of our own destiny in terms of the economic future that we want to create that is both green, clean, and healthy. So I'll end on that note. Thank you, Cecil. That was amazing. Um, I totally second all of that and, and what everyone has said. Um, I think I'm going to add in the, the chat the link to um, Movement Generation has done a great job um, creating a small zine about the just transition. And it talks about um, the movement from a current extractive economy into a new regenerative economy. And we have to do it with people and the planet all together. You can't, you know, separate those. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a bit here, um, but I think the zine is really amazing. It's a short, powerful, well-written and illustrated. Um, just taking all these ideas and just putting them into this one thing. And it's what PUSH has really taken throughout every single aspect of our organization and how we move forward. So instead of going into it, I'm just going to drop it in the chat. But thank you everyone for inviting us. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Karen, for your excellent moderating. Uh, we have a lot of these webinars, so we might call on you again. Uh, that was terrific. And just, you know, thank you again. Um, I echo what Mana said that uh, this couldn't have been any better. Uh, incredible presenters and very inspiring uh, showing that we are creating the world we want to see. So thank you all so, so much. Um, we will be sharing the recording and slides, and we can also share uh, the questions and answers from the chat uh, to everybody who registered. And there'll be a recording to share on social media. I know a lot of people were tuned in already uh, on the live stream on Facebook. So that's exciting that this will continue to reach more people and uh, we'll keep building this movement. So thank you all again uh, for being here, for sharing your incredible work and hope we can keep building together. Have a great weekend, everybody.